أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي I just want to first uh, start off by saying jazakum uh, khair for uh, coming out today I know today is uh, Saturday and most uh, most of us uh, you know either we have a family of ourselves or we belong to a family that and we spend those Saturdays with uh, with with the family and so you know may Allah reward you immensely for sacrificing your time and effort to come and have this important discussion so as, uh, as, as, as Osama mentioned at the outset, uh, sort of this is our, our topic today and this is the agenda that we will be uh, discussing. So, uh, you know, begin with a call to action, discuss Islamophobia in Canada. We'll examine whether, you know, like a lot of, when I was driving in today, um, I saw a lot of signs as, from uh, one of the political parties and they had like stop Harper on, on the signs and, uh, you know, we'll be discussing is Harper really the, 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 the issue or is it, is it the system that's the issue? We'll look in terms of, uh, as you know, people who've tried to make change in the, uh, in, 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 in the society, uh, especially Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how did they make that change? What did they address? Uh, because a lot of people are telling us that, you know, you got Islamophobia, so let's go vote. That's going to change our situation. Uh, then we'll look at an action, a proposed action plan, which, uh, you know, based on, on what we've uh, looked at and what we, what the, you know, study, a, a deep study of reality will tell us, a, an action plan that will work. Um, and then Anas, so he'll be walking through some kind of specifics of that action plan, and then we will have a Q&A and a discussion. So first I want to begin with a call to action. So most of the time you come to a lecture, uh, and you kind of feel good, and you go home, and you, you feel like you did something. However, this is uh, going to be a little bit more expensive. Uh, we're going to need you to, uh, after, the, after I'm going to discuss it, and, and we're going to look at, you know, we really need everyone in this room to help us to go forward and really work with us to uh, fight Islamophobia, right? It's not, uh, it's not just uh, uh, the usual thing you're used to, just to consume the information and leave. And I want to begin by first uh, just, you know, re relating to my experience as a Muslim. You know, I was born in Canada, I grew up in Canada. Uh, and. You know, my consciousness of the Ummah, it began, uh, from what I can recollect, and my earliest memory of the consciousness of the Ummah, it began with, uh, with, with a leaflet that was handed out to me at a masjid, and it was an invitation to do a demonstration for Palestine. This was in the early 90s. And what I, can, I can still remember that picture in my mind of this uh, lifeless body of this two-year-old uh, uh, Muslim boy, uh, you know, who was shot dead by the Zionist forces. And of course, now we are seeing those similar pictures today, and it's been you know, how, how long it's been, it's been like, you know, three decades, and I'm sure, you know, it, it's, 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 it's ongoing, even before that. You know, and then after, after Palestine, uh, and, and the, the agony of Palestine continues, uh, there was Bosnia. And I remember going to fundraising with my, uh, with my family, uh, as again, as a young, as a, young, uh, as a youth, and, uh, and, you know, watching the horrors of, of Bosnia, because of the geopolitical situation of then, uh, you know, the West was interested in exposing the crimes of the Serbs. Uh, against the Muslims, and you know, it was it was uh, a c community that was identified as Muslim. Like that was what distinguished them. Palestinians, you know, weren't identified as Muslims, even though we knew they were. But this group was specifically identified as Muslims, and I can still remember, uh, you know, this. Uh, there was a tray, and what, and the horror of what was in that tray was uh, men's testicles. Right? Is that that's the kind of the the horrors that was uh, in terms of Bosnia that was done to us and. If you've been following the news recently, they found a mass grave of our brothers who were, uh, you know, massacred uh, in that grave. And so the question we have to ask ourselves as Muslims is how are we going to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment, uh, knowing that our Ummah is under threat, and now that threat has reached us in Canada, how are we going to answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment if we just, you know, leave this, this room and, and just continue as if nothing's happening? That's really the question we'll have to ask ourselves now, because as Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, said, is that, you know, you know, account yourself now before you're accounted, right? So we'll have to account ourselves. We know there's a problem. And it's, you know, this problem is especially pernicious for us here in the West. And the reason is because everything's fine for us. You know, we have food, we have running water. Uh, once a brother was t explaining to me what it's like to be hungry. And some people have the audacity to say it's like fasting in the month of Ramadan is like feeling what it's like to be hungry. And we have no idea what it's like to be hungry. Because uh, the brother was explaining to me, all you can think about is food. And I've never experienced that in my life, ever. I've always had enough food by Allah's leave, I've, and all praises are due to Him. Not, nothing to do with my own account or my father's account. Is that we've always had food, so how will we answer when we had such luxury and such you know, opportunity and such wealth that the Roman kings would be jealous of us that we did nothing? However, 
there's a caveat to that, and that is that we can't be reactionary. We can't just uh, jump and, and react to things. You know, we, we see this uh, uh, hate against Islam coming at us from you know, one of the political parties, and we can't just be running in directions just because they tell us to. Doma has done that for a very long time, and it's, it hasn't succeeded. So we have to sit back and think about a proper strategic way to respond to this. So I want to break down the uh, Islam, Islamophobia into three pieces. So one is Islamophobia is um, in, in, in how is it used to promote foreign policy. Then we'll look at how Islamophobia is used to promote uh, uh, you know, uh, domestic policies. And then also we'll just look at how things are going on in the election. So one of the first things that comes to mind when we like look at the current government is the support for the Zionist entity uh, and you know its unwavering support to that. However, it's unfair to actually single out the conservatives for this uh, crime. All the political parties running for office today support the Zionist entity, and that is like uh, something that they've all gone on the record to say is that they will support the Zionist entity. However, they do use Islamophobia in in order to support that uh, the Zionist entity in terms of. You know, claiming that uh, you know, like uh, that they're protecting the West and you know against the terrorists and things like that. And by that, they mean uh, Muslims. There's also the current uh, invasion of Iraq and uh, Syria uh, that uh, you know that is going on. You know, then and this this is, has resulted in Canadians actually the you know bombs uh, killing people. You know, it's funny when they talk about terrorism, but I'm sure those people who were killed by those bombs were terrorized. And you know, it's 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 part. Of, and the only and the way they sell it is through promoting hatred of Muslims and uh, de dehumanizing us as as people. So when the bomb lands on them, it's not as if it's a you know average white Christian Canadian who was killed by such a bomb. However, I think from a foreign policy perspective, I think one of the things that really highlights Islamophobia is Omar, Omar Khadr, right? So Omar Khadr, what what he was a child, and the only, uh, like, he languished the longest of, out of any of the, the G8 nations who had a citizen languishing in Guantanamo. As a child, he languished there. And you, you would say, how is it possible that you don't see a child and you see a monster? And that's, again, due to Islamophobia. In terms of domestic policies, we have C24, uh, you know, the conservative strip to Zakaria Amara of his citizenship, you know, during the election time for a specific reason, again. Uh, promoting how they're tough on Muslims, and it's made you know people like myself, even though I was born here in Canada, into a second-class citizen. We have C51 again uh, to you know the authorizing the spying, the Snowden type uh, you know surveillance of people, not just Muslims, but also like native groups and environmentalists, uh, and also that just in general, like all Canadian society, there's a mistake to think that this policy is just for Muslims. Anyone who decides to speak up against the government, this policy is for them, right? And we know we've seen the depression, when the depression occurred, uh, and capitalism has a very weak economic system, uh, despite its uh, dominance, uh, and it's prone to these economic shocks. And when the economic shocks occur, that's when people get on the streets, as we saw with the Occupy movement. And that movement was not, dis it wasn't that people got bored and they went home. 9,000 arrests destroyed that movement. So it was, a, it, was, it was finished through physical violence, violence from the state, and they, and they were spied on by similar kind of measures. So it's not, this is not just for Muslims, and it's, it's a mistake just to see that issue. And this is indeed, like when we talk about our plan, this is one of the things we can discuss about, about that. But they're just using Islamophobia to pass these draconian measures through. And just on that, on that issue, we should recognize that this propaganda that they're using against Muslims, you'll see behind me a bar graph that looks at the, most, at the top five common uh, causes of death in Canada. What's missing? Exactly. So it's, 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 you don't see Muslims as a leading cause of death in, in Canada, right? The leading cause of death is cancer. It's heart disease. These kind of things. And I'll, I'll show you uh, in a later slide on how, and then the next slide actually, on how that's so pernicious. Uh, sorry, the uh, slide after this one. Where Islamophobia is really going to start hitting home for us is when it starts affecting how we practice our deen. Right, so it's it's one thing that they're just using it as propaganda as a way to promote kind of policies with other intentions, but now it's starting to affect us as Muslims. So first and foremost was the Charter of Values. The Charter of Values was a, a way for them to create, um, uh, make Muslims into second-class citizens, where sisters had to choose between their livelihood and had to choose between their Islam. So they had to choose between wearing the hijab and the niqab and 
working for the, for the federal government. And in Quebec, the federal government is what, quite wide, like to work for the hospitals, to work for the, you know, for the school, which you, know, you would find uh, sisters uh, working there. This was a, a specifically targeting them. So again, now the pressure is being put on us as how we practice Islam. Then we also supposed to have the niqab debate. Uh, I'm not sure if you've been following the niqab debate, as they, as they say. Is, uh, as it's been widely recognized, and actually Canadians themselves and the mainstream society have recognized that, that this is complete distraction. Uh, Rick Mercer had a program, I'm not sure if you had to see it, but definitely check it out, where he talks about uh, you know, how this is just a distraction through a humorous kind of, kind of perspective. And actually, people are showing up to the uh, polls wearing masks. And in protest, uh, like uh, of this, of the of this of this kind of distraction. Also, we had, and this is more of a of a provincial issue uh, about the. Uh, this is about uh, the schooling, the education curriculum. Uh, Muslims protested, and they they actually pulled kids out of class uh, uh, to 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 demonstrate their opposition to uh, the school encro encroaching on their right to parent. Just as an atheist wouldn't want alien values to impart it to their children, Muslims don't want values, uh, alien values to be imparted to their children. And this is really the, the way this should be framed, is the right to parent. It's not about anything else other than the right to parent, which is, should be belong to the parents. Also then we had finally had the, uh, in the Toronto School Board, you had the anti-Islamic uh, groups uh, protesting the right for Muslims to pray at school. However, I think the most pernicious issue that affected us as Muslim was on the attacks on Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And you may ask, why is that? Like this is like if I can't wear hijab, how am I going to go to work? If I if I can't pray in the school, like you know, how's this worse? Because the goal of this is to make us secular. As as Allah subhanahu wa taala revealed to us in the Quran, the Jews and Christians will never be happy with you until you follow their milla, their way, meaning. You look, at the, you look at the Christians, especially like how they insult Isa alayhi salam and the other Anbiya, and you look at the Jews who do the same, and they want us to do the same with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. So the first, prote first set of cartoons comes out, we protest. Second set of cartoons comes out, the protest gets a little lighter. The third set comes out, and then the protests even get lighter, and even if they exist at all. That, and that shows how we're becoming desensitized, how our connection to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam is slowly being uh, you know, sanded away by these constant attacks. And that's why this is the most deadliest attack really on us because it's invisible. You can't see it. It's coming in your mind. Your dedication to Rasulullah is slipping away slowly by slowly. And of course, we saw this uh, Islamophobia in the elections. And I, I, I live in Hamilton and I got this uh, card in my mailbox. And I want you to look at the last bullet. Protecting Canadians from jihadist terrorists. Jihadist terrorist, right? Now, I showed you the most leading cause of death in Canadian society. Why is one third of the election campaign dedicated to something that's not one of the top three causes of, of Canadian death? This is, this, this is uh, what they call dog whistle politics. This is where they use coded things. They talk about jihadist terrorism. Well, what about Ray Bork, uh, Bork, who shot up those RCMP officers because of political reason, which is another way of calling terrorism. He's not going to defend the country against that. But this will get votes, right, from the racist people, right, from the evangelicals, right? So that's why this is, this is what's going on. And then also we had this debate, the French debate, um, where we were in the, in the debate what happened was the, and I'll, I'll play it towards the end just as a, as a refresher, uh, just before I give them, pass the mic to Anas. But in, in, in the debate, they were basically, uh, they were uh, contesting as to who was going to oppress Muslims more. Gilles Dessep was saying from the bloc, was trying to say that, Harper, why are you just banning the niqab from the, from the ceremonies? I'm going to ban it here, 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 and here. Right? And, and then Mulcair was saying, though he came across as being positive towards Muslims, he said that he's going to go after the oppressors. Who, who, do Muslim men have magical powers to force women to do things? Most, of, of you who are married, can you force your wife to do anything? We're just like, we're just like any, other, any, other, any other human being. We have to convince our wife. We have to talk to them. We do that. This, so that's the thing, is that 
this oppressor Muslim male, that mythical beast that exists, doesn't exist. It's part of the Islamophobia. So even in his statement, he was Islamophobic. So the question is, is that this Islamophobia, just, is, should we just blame Harper? And would you know, getting Trudeau in office or Mulcair in office, would that suddenly get rid of the problem? Or is it a wider problem, the system? So our first and foremost uh, idea that we know that it's, it's voting and uh, just trying to get rid of him through the electoral process is not going to work is that voting is haram. And the, and the reason is, is that when we look at what the vote means, the, what the vote means is that you're going to, as it says here on the Elections Canada website, you're going to elect a member of parliament to the House of Commons to make decisions and then pass laws on your behalf. So you, if as a Muslim, go to the polls, you're putting XYZ candidate to elect uh, to implement laws. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given us the right to implement laws. Like, you, like, like we're, we're decent people here in this room. Like we mean well, like, we're, like I said, we're sacrificing our Saturday. So even if what, us as human beings was to devise an economic policy or a political policy or a foreign policy, not based on Quran and Sunnah, it's gonna fail, right? And that's the thing is that none of these parties have something from a point of view that will succeed because it's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that knows best. It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that can devise a system. Like when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to pay zakat, why do we, why do we comply, right? But when it comes to taxes, we try to you know, minimize the taxes, obviously staying within the law, but try to minimize as much as possible. So most of when we pay our zakat, we give more. Because it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who, 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 who decreed such a thing. Whereas taxes, oh, it's probably those corporations who are going to you know, benefit from the taxes. So it's the rich people, right? That's man-made law versus Allah's, Allah's law. And so Allah does not, he did not give us the right to legislate, and therefore we can't elect someone to parliament. And, you know, and so therefore it's haram to vote. The other thing is, is that it's important to look at the, the take a, a deeper look at the system as to how the system actually works and, this, and the way the, the, the party system works. When you vote in a candidate, you're actually voting for a party, not a person. So that person is beholden to their party. So there's something called, what is called a party whip. You might ask, what's a party whip? A party whip is someone whose who's, who's job is it to make sure that the leader of the party's demands and, and, and vision is implemented on the party. So when like Stephen Harper and, and, and Trudeau will have a whip that will ensure that, the, that their parties will vote exactly as they tell them to vote. So I'll give you an example of how this happened. So the conservatives, uh, they wanted to restore the definition, traditional defini de definition of marriage. And, and this is why some Muslims vote conservative, is that he wanted to you know, say that ma marriage is between men and women, and not between men and men and women and women. So now, you'll be surprised who vote against this bill. So as you can see with the circle, the one who voted against this bill is Umar al-Ghabra, who's, uh, who's a Muslim and who obviously, and I haven't spoke to him, but I'm sure he's a Muslim and he believes that such a, such a relationship is haram. I'm not gonna doubt his, his, his iman or anything like that. However, he has to vote as his party tells him to vote because this is the way the system works. So he has to put his personal beliefs aside and work with the party because the consequence of doing that, of not doing that, is he'll be thrown out of the party. And then he can't, make, he can't be part of the party anymore. So this is what happened to one of the MPs in uh, Manitoba, Bev uh, de Jarlet. She, uh, she wanted, she, what, her constituency was against same-sex marriage and uh, Jack Layton was for it, who was the, was the head of the NDP at that time. She voted according to her constituency, according to what democracy says, right? We're gonna vote, we're representing the people. She got thrown out of the party. Another, another individual, which is, might, you might say even more relevant to us, is that he was, uh, he was anonymous. Uh, uh, he wanted to vote against the Af war in Afghanistan. Yeah, you want to stop the killing of our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan, right? However, both the liberals and the, and I believe the conservatives were obviously for that war. And so when he spoke out on it, both the, the prime minister and the party whip looked at him and was like, what the hell are you doing, right? And they, he was forced to sit at the back for the rest of the session. And he was, he was basically sidelined and marginalized. So this is how the system works. It's, it's the, 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 the system is beholden to the parties. So the question we have to ask beyond that is really who runs the show? Who really sets up the parties and who, who's really behind the things? And there was a study that was done in the US by Princeton 
over many, many years, and they studied whether the public opinion has any influence on policy. And what they found is that if you're part of a special interest group or the 1%, it did have influence on the policy. What they found is that if the rich didn't want a policy to pass, 62% of the time it would fail. If the rich wanted something, they would get it about 45%. But the interesting thing is, how do the regular uh, people uh, fare, like the 99%, like every one of us? When the majority of citizens disagree with economic elites or with organized interests, they generally lose. Even when fairly large majorities of American favor policy changes, they generally don't get it. So what it means is the rich run the show. And the reason that's important to us here in Canada is because our, the largest trading partner of Canada is the US. So a lot of the, the, the kind of the policies and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the way the system is run depends on the US. And also, like Harper himself, he got schooled by the same sort of, uh, uh, pol uh, sort of uh, political consultants that actually helped the Republicans to win. So he brought, them, he brought a lot of that support over. And I'll go over actually how, you know, how that American influence actually got him elected. So Canada really is not that different from America. The top 84 families have as much wealth as the bottom 11.4 million people in Canada. The top 84 families have as much wealth as the bottom 11.4 million Canadians. Now, 84 families can probably fit in this complex. And 11.4 million, that's like one third of Canada, right? If you took like one third of Canada, that's that, who, that's, that's that balance. Do you think that happened by accident? Or is it because they spent $25 billion lobbying politicians to get their way? So, so what you saw in the US applies here as well, right? Though they didn't do this, the study didn't include in Canada, you can see that the corporations through their money are able to influence politics. So when the, when the, when the financial crisis happened, though everyone uh, bragged about Canada's uh, banking system, the reality is that Canada and Canadian banks needed to be bailed out to the tune of $114 billion. How much is $114 billion? It's five times the current student debt. So th they could have bailed out the students five times over instead of bailing out the banks. Even though the students are the most productive, like generate, like kind of, if you look at a student who's going into society, the most productive people are the students. They're going to get, buy houses, they're going to start families. And, and studies actually show that because they're so loaded, uh, saddled with debt, they're not going to buy houses, right? Because they, how are they going to afford a mortgage if they do that? So if, 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 this, if this, this group's not bailed out, how are they going to contribute to Canadian society? But that's the point. It's the 1% that rule. In terms of Harper, what enabled him to get into power was the support from uh, corporate Canada. Corporate Canada was, was tired of the Liberals ru ruling, and the reason being, again, because they had $50 billion worth of trade going back and forth between the US and Canada. What the Liberals were doing because of their public stance on the war in Iraq and other, other, uh, uh, you know, other anti-American attitudes they were exposing, the elite Canadians were, were afraid their trade was being jeopardized. So they wanted to put a new party in, but the problem with the right-wing parties is that they were divided. There was two parties. There was the Canadian Alliance, and then there was the Progressive Conservatives. So what they threatened them is that if you do not unite, we're going to cut off your funding. As you know, elections are expensive. You know, they got to run all those attack ads, right? So. The, with, without that unification forced by corporate Canada, Stephen Harper would never rose to power because the right would always have been consistently divided and with the way the, the Canadian being a liberal society would continue on voting liberal. So when you look at the society, uh, as, 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 I've, as I've been uh, sort of discussing with you, you have the elites that support Harper and then you also have his base, you know, the, the media, the National Post, and some say the Sun TV is, is Harper's specific uh, you know, uh, mouthpiece. Uh, then you have evangelicals, the pro-Zionists, you have the bloc, and you have the conservative party. These are the factors that are actually boiling up and, and creating the Islamophobia. So the question is, is that if you get rid of Harper, will you really fix this part of society? 
If Harper goes and Trudeau comes, is the Islamophobia just going to magically disappear? Like, just think about that. Like, if you're someone who, who's been propagandized and you hate Muslims, and if you read uh, any comments on uh, Yahoo News when something Muslim is reported, you can find those haters out there easily. Do you suddenly think they're going to just say, oh, Trudeau's in power. I should stop hating Muslims. It's not going to happen, is it? So the, 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 it's the system that's the underlying problem. And uh, you know, if you, there's a lot of studies done on propaganda and, and media studies like manufacturing consent. We can talk more about this. But if you, this is the way actually democratic systems really work. They work through this propaganda machine. Um, and, and so voting is not going to change our uh, situation, right? Because first of all, it's haram. And secondly, it, it doesn't work. It's the rich that run the situation, right? They, it's the rich that run the show. Uh, as you see, and there's many other examples to how the rich policies, like Harper is not just going after Muslims, he's going after environmental policy, the natives, and stuff like that. If you read any of the sort of the, the people who are disgruntled, like if you go to chapters right now and try to get a book, there's like, like three or four books on anti-Harper books out there, like criticizing him. So it's, it's not just us, it's, it's the moneyed interests that have got into Canadian politics. And is that really a surprise? You're here. Sacrificing your Saturday, investing your Saturday here, where you could be having fun doing something else. You're sacrificing and investing your life and your time, and may Allah reward you immensely for that, to come and f fight for our interests as Muslims, to practice Islam, right? That's why you're here, right? For, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to, to protect the rights of, of, of Muslims in Canada, to, to, to safeguard their deen, to protect our families, right? Don't you think the rich would do the same thing? Wouldn't they spend $25 billion to influence public policy? To get Harper elected to someone who will, who will work according to their interests? So, so that, that, that's the, the way the system works. So it shouldn't be a shock or a surprise that, that, uh, that this is the way, the way, uh, that's the way it is. So now I've told you what doesn't work. So what does work, right? So that's the question. So really have to go back first and look at society and how society really functions. There's a myth. That's purported by the capitalist belief uh, that society is just a group of people. But really, when you actually look at the, and carefully analyze society, society is not just people. It's the, the common glue that binds us together. That's really what forms society, right? When, that, when, that, when the person is swimming in the, in the, in the media, when he goes to his, uh, uh, you know, goes to work, he goes to, uh, he listens to music, all these things are what, uh, you know, kind of inform him or her of their opinion, right? It's, it's that common kind of uh, medium that we swim in as human beings. And when you study, the, uh, study all the different people who may change, they may change in that medium. I'm going to go through some, uh, many different examples and I'll, I'll, I'll finish off with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to show how he may change and how he will operate in that medium. So what the activists do is that they address the common emotions, common thoughts of society, make their case to the, the, public, uh, to the public masses. Then that is what influences the institutions and that will, is what leads to change in society. So I first want to begin with a question. Why do we only work 40 hours a week? And the reason why that's an important question is because when you look at our brothers and sisters in Bangladesh or the people in China, they don't work 40 hours a week. Okay. Yeah, like 80 hours a week probably, right? It's the same companies, right? Whether it's Apple employing uh, workers in China to make iPhones for $300 a month, or it's Apple employing you here, or like employing someone here to work at the Apple store. Why, why, they in, why in Canada, are they in, in America as well, why are they limited to 40 hours a week? But in China, they can work them 60 hours a week, 80 hours a week, and there's no, no consequences. Because this has to do with the way corporations make money. The more you pay wages, the less profit you make as a shareholder, right? So it's, it's simple math. Uh, why would they give it up? And so the answer lies in the labor movement. The labor movement, uh, you know, beginning of the sort of the beginning of the labor movement was around the 1877. So the Civil War happened in, uh, in around 1865 to finish, and then, you know, big time uh, capitalism and industrialism came to America around the 1877. So what we saw happening in the Muslim world, like the Arab Spring, actually happened in America. People just rebelled. 
they were sick of this inhumane conditions and they rebelled. And then after a while, the people, so there was a lot of different people that emerged from that kind of uprising. Uh, so there was people who were anarchist, uh, you know, had different philosophies of government. Uh, they were communists. They were also just, just regular labor people who just wanted a, a fair share of the pie. They didn't disagree with capitalism in its, uh, you know, in its belief, but they wanted just a fair share of the pie. So what they decided to do is like, hey, what we can unite around is the eight-hour workday. So let's unite around that and make our case that this is something that uh, we, we, we do. And so they would have strikes. They would have public demonstrations. You know, they'd bring the women and children, and the police got uh, heavy-handed, as you see, like in Palestine they do. And they beat and clubbed the women and children, and these things would build sympathy. It wasn't the intention of the movement to have their wives and children beaten, but, that, but be just because the corporations were so aggressive. And that won public opinion on their favor. And so then those companies were forced to concede to labor's demands. So what you see they didn't do is go to the ballot box. Right? The labor movement did not, the 40-hour work we did not come through the ballot box. It came through these types of actions. Then we also have the African-American civil rights movement in the, in the US. They too also, actually they didn't have the right to vote. So it's a really interesting case as to how they got their rights, how they got uh, you know, how they desegregated America. So what that, what that involved is civil disobedience. Civil disobedience was that they would disobey those racist laws on purpose, with pr the purpose of, of creating a controversy, which would eventually end up in courts, to, to stir the common emotions, common thoughts of the society, uh, to, 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 to change the, 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 the segregated America into having a unified society where blacks would not be treated as sec second class citizens. So that took organization again. That took like the people to sit on the bus. So uh, black women specifically, Rosa Parks is the most famous example of that, but there were many black women who would sit on the, in the, in the white area of the bus just so they would get arrested and then they would have a lawyer who would work pro bono for free because if you ever worked with a lawyer, you know they charge you an arm and a leg. Uh, they, had, they, work, they would work for free uh, and they would bring these cases to the, to the court. And then they'd have also demonstrations. They'd also uh, you know, organize also boycotts. There was a famous Montgomery bus boycott where these, these, these companies that implemented racist laws, such as uh, segregation, they went after them. Now, you know, you know, you and me, we have options. We can take the car to work or we can take the GO train to work, right? You know, I you know, take the GO train to work because I hate uh, driving in Toronto traffic. But do you, do you think African Americans had that choice? Being poor? They didn't, right? So they had to organize rides to work. How are they going to get to work? How are they going to provide for a living? So they had to have an organized system where they have taxis and they have uh, people with cars. They organize a way to get to work. So again, the movement had to be very organized and purposeful. It wasn't just random stuff, right? And again, none of these people went to the ballot box, right? They organized this through addressing the common emotions, common thoughts, and, and making their case that, you know, that you know, us as human beings, like how can you discriminate on basis of the color of your skin? This is anti-human. So when I was preparing this presentation, I was uh, doing research, and uh, you know, I never thought of including this group in my presentation. You know, because I'd, I'd, I'd known, you know, we all know about Malcolm X and the rights and the situation of the blacks, and I had, you know, previously had studied the situation of the, you know, labor movement and things like that, because you see a lot of parallels between how they went after the labor movement, how, how they're coming after us as Muslims. The group that also had to work through this medium in, North, in the North American, uh, in the sort of the current context, is the 1%. So the 1% also, if they want to make change, they had to work through the, 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 uh, the actual, the, the public opinion. They had to change the public opinion first. So let me, let me walk you through how this actually works. So after World War II, the dominant form of economics in Britain, and I'll focus on Britain for this example, but, but generally in the Western world was Keynesian economics. Keynesian economics is the philosophy of tax and spend. The idea is, is that capitalism has boom and bust. So when there's a boom, you tax like crazy so that you can inject in the economy when there's a bust. So this, this was the one philosophy. 
The other philosophy is exposed by Friedrich von Hayek, which is the current, uh, where the current world has shifted, doggy dog capitalism, like where there's no social safety net, no health care, nothing, everyone, every man, woman for him themselves. Let the devil take the hindmost is what they say. Right? So that's Friedrich von Hayek's kind of idea. So these were the two economic philosophies that were there. Keynesian was dominant, right? Like the idea of you know, healthcare, social welfare. You know, these people just fought a war. Let's provide them a country that's worth living in. So Hayek, uh, who had this philosophy, was attracted, obviously, the rich, right? So Anthony Fisher was such a person. He, he made a lot of money from factory farming chicken. You know, like those horror movies you see with uh, Food Inc. and stuff like that, where the chicken are all cooped up? Anthony Fishner was the one who made a lot of money off that, bringing that to England. So he thought, you know, I've read Hayek. I want to I wanna fight socialism. So how do I do that? So he went, to, he went to Hayek. And he had a conversation with him. And he's like, listen, I'm going to get into politics. And I'm going to fight these socialist ideas. And what did Hayek tell him? He said, don't waste your time going to uh, 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 fighting politics with the socialists. Don't waste your time going to politics. Instead, get involved in the battleground of ideas. What we need to do is we need to fund think tanks that will make research, that will influence universities, influence schools, influence the media, so both the radio media and also the print media. Anthony Fisher joined the Mount Pelerin Society in 1954, which was this institution designed to do that. And then 25 years later, so the 1% have suburb. They had patience to work through the medium. Margaret Thatcher got elected in England, and she is the one embodiment of these ideas of Hayek's philosophy, and basically destroyed the unions. They destroyed the, the social fabric in, in England, which they're still reeling from. And you see this kind of thing. Uh, you know, has been spread to Canada as well. This is in Canada, it's been done through the Fraser Institute and other right-wing think tanks. So of course though, the most important example for us is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I want to begin first by making it clear, though despite our situation here in Canada, specifically here in Canada, our situation is not as bad as our brothers and sisters in uh, as, as the Sahaba faced in Mecca. And the story that illustrates that the best, I, or that kind of give, really kind of, for me, really brings it home, is the story of Khaba bin Arat. May Allah be pleased with them. Khaba bin Arat was a slave, and he was one of the first 10 people to accept Islam. And during the time of Umar bin al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with them, during his, khil his khilafa, they were discussing. There was a group of them, and they were discussing about the torture of Makkah. So Khabab bin Arat, instead of just talking about it, he lifted up his shirt to expose his back. On his back were these holes. Did you imagine that, like seeing holes on someone's back, like just indentations in them? And obviously the uh, the, the assembly, including Umar bin Khattab, was horrified at looking at such a thing. And so they wondered, how, did, how could that happen? Khabab bin Arat, the way the Mushrikeen of Quraysh used to torture him, is they would put hot coals on his back until he could smell his own flesh burn. Just want to picture that for a second. Could you imagine lying there, do, being able to do nothing, just feeling the pain sear through your back, and all you can hear is, is this, your flesh burning. That's, that was the situation, and may Allah be pleased with all the Sahabas. It's their sacrifice that were, were Muslims today. It's those sacrifices that they did that if they hadn't taken those sacrifices, none of us would be Muslims today. And it's in this context that Rasulullah was offered the crown to be a king of the society of the Quraysh. He, he loved his companions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He hated them watch, uh, the being, he, he didn't like it that, that they were being tortured. He could have stopped it by taking the crown, but he didn't. Right? Because that's not the way you make change in society. That's not the way to make a difference. What he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
Uh, he didn't even engage in the turf war that was going on in the society. The society had clashes between who was the better tribe. Was it Bani Makhzum? Was it Bani Umayyah? Bani Hisham? Bani Hisham gave him Juwari. They gave him protection. But he didn't go and say, oh, Bani Hisham is better than uh, these other parties. He didn't go to Dar al and tell people that. He refused to get involved in the system. Instead, he challenged the Quraysh and their ideas and their beliefs. He would challenge them about their idolatry. He would challenge them about their economic practices of riba and interest. He would challenge them about burly of the female, right? This is something that the tribe did to, 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 uh, to become a stronger tribe. A woman is a waste of, of, of resources. Have a son instead. He fought them on that, even though that, that was something that, 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 that was a core part of their beliefs. And they tortured his sahabas, they tortured him. They bribed him, they offered women, they offered money, they offered the crown, but he refused all that and he stood firm on La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And you may say, and this is a fair question, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how did he succeed in Makkah? He had to flee to Medina, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right, he didn't get support in Makkah. He had to, he had to, he had to get out of there. And we all know the story of migration, how he had to plan, he had to you know, go south because that way the Quraysh would, you know, he knew the Quraysh were looking at them, they were looking at him in front of the cave. The fruits of Rasulullah Wasallam's work were not seen during his lifetime, but after his death. Wasallam. When he, when he died and Abu Bakr became the Khalifa, all of the tribes except uh, a few of them, including and uh, Ta'if, Mecca and Medina, they're the ones, the few towns that stayed with Abu Bakr. May Allah be pleased with them. Now, if Quraysh wanted to recapture the political power from the uh, Jadazid al-Arab, the Arabian Peninsula, now is the time to do it. All the Arabs are, are, are rebelling. Now is the time to seize the power. As you know, when, uh, when Abu Bakr was discussing and the Sahabas were discussing in Banu Thaqifah about who should be the Khalifa, Abu Bakr said, may Allah be pleased with all the Sahabas, that they will, the Arabs will follow Quraysh, they won't follow you like the Ansar, they won't follow the, the tribes of Medina. That was his thing. So if Quraysh rebelled and, 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 they were, and, they, and they rebelled at the point, they would easily capture the political power. They would re regain their, their, the place they lost uh, because, the, because the Muslims had conquered them. But that's where you saw Rasulullah wasallam's work come into fruition. That those 13 long years he spent in Mecca, giving da'wah, challenging the Quraysh in their beliefs, building a public opinion for Islam, suddenly that came to the forefront. That's where, where the Quraysh became amongst the, the core support for the Islamic State, for Abu Bakr. And it's probably best summarized by Ikrama Abi Jahl, who later on accepted Islam, about how he felt about his actions before and after. He said, to Rasulullah when he gave him the shahada and pledge, he said that I'm going to fight twice as hard as I try to fight you. And he died shaheed in Yarmouk when I accepted shahada. So this is the, the, this is the, 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 the effort and this is the work that Rasulullah that he did. He worked through, again, through the public opinion, challenge to the Quraysh, because when, in the time of, the, of, the, of, the, of his time when he used to recite the ayat, they knew it was from Allah because of the miracle of the Qur'an and the way the miracle works. So when he would put it forth, his challenge of those practices by reciting the ayat of the Qur'an, the Quraysh understood that, they, that, that this is true and they were afraid of, of the recitation of the Qur'an and they were afraid of these ideas because they knew that this would move the masses and as you can see, it eventually did. So before I go into the action plan, I just want to give two quick things before to just to, to, just to drive it home that when groups like the African Americans and the labor movement, when they turn to the ballot box, they get burned by the ballot box. So Barack Obama, and this is uh, one statistic from an article in the, in the Atlantic Monthly. So it's it's uh, you know there's a lot of hate against Obama again because of the racism in the states, but this is from the Atlantic Monthly, so it's it's from a reputable source. And what it says is, and 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 inshallah we'll have a discussion on the situation of the African Americans in the in, the, in one of the future circles on this inshallah. One in 15 African Americans is in jail in contrast to one in 106 white uh, people. So let me say that again. One in 115, one out of 15 people of, of blacks are in jail compared to one in 106. So how is Obama, who's, a, who's, who's black, unable to change their situation, right? So when the blacks thought they, that he, he would get into office, 
you would change your situation? It hasn't changed. And this is just one statistic amongst many statistics. When, when labor, the Democratic Party in the US is labor's party. They've always turned to uh, the Democratic Party to get their rights. What the Democratic Party do in 1992 was completely betray them. They signed NAFTA. And NAFTA, what it did, it was destroy the ability of labor to organize. As I showed you before, the way labor is able to, to get back at the corporations is to strike. If they're making stuff, you strike, you stop making money. So it becomes, you're challenging the companies. You go in, and the unions then become a base to challenge society, right? Because the unions are that kind of coalescing point for other people who are not part of the union, right? So what happened was once NAFTA was signed, and this was illegal, but this shows you who really runs the show again, is what the corporations would do is that they would hear rumors of a union being formed. So what they would then do is they would say, they would put up signs saying, we're, transfer we're moving to Mexico. Who wants to come with us? And so then obviously everyone started freaking out, right? They'd, they'd, they'd get scared and then they would, they would, they would stop doing that and, they, and, they would, and that's how they, they defeated the, the unionization movement and the labor movement of America. It was NAFTA and the globalization in general that destroyed it, but who brought it in? The people that voted for, the, the, the labor movement voted in the Democrats and then the Democrats came and destroyed them because the Democrats, just like the Republicans, are owned by the 1%. You know? They say Republicrat in the US because they're just really one party, two faces of the same coin. So now I'm gonna begin with the five E action plan. So there's like five steps to this plan. So what, what the goal of this plan is, is to change the public opinion for Islam, to fight Islamophobia. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to leverage what we learn from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And, and this is what, what I was trying to show, like with the labor movement and the African American movement and the 1%, is that this is Sunnah the law. This is the way societies work. If you want to make change, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam guided the through the Hukum Shari. And you can see it, that's how, that's how it works. So how can we apply that to our current context? How can we apply that to fight Islamophobia here in Canada? So we have us as a Muslim community. As I was mentioning, Harper, like this idea of Islamophobia, it's not something that just Muslims don't like. It's a, it's a, it's a wider uh, cause of frustration and many academics and other people are speaking out against it. So the, 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 the point is for us is to reach out to those academics and create a community-based movement that will fight this, this type of politics in Canada with the goal of getting rid of Islamophobia. So I'm gonna go through those five points right now. So the first one is engage, end dog whistle politics, explain Islam, enable, and empower. So let me begin with engage. The first thing we have to do as a community is engage the community leaders, and some of them are here. Engage the community leaders and the activists for us to work together to have a cohesive strategy where we where we start working in society, as you saw, with, as Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did first and foremost, but also the other activists, how they went into society and started challenging these ideas, right? So first, so we have to get a group together that will be committed and dedicated to this, right? And so, and, and then this group, its goal is also to engage the civic leadership of Canada. So those groups that I mentioned before, so the academics, the, the union leaders, the, the labor activists, the, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, Principal politicians. There is no reason why someone who is a principal politician, who has actually has principles, we shouldn't reach out to them. So someone like like Elizabeth May. And really, the core of, of our of our message to the uh, to the people <laughs> is to end dog whistle politics. And you may say, well, what is dog whistle politics? What what happened after the uh, the civil rights movement succeeded in desegregating America? is that the Republicans had to come up with another strategy in terms of getting uh, reelected into, um, into, into, into government, right? And they realized because it was the Democrats who gave the rights to the blacks, a lot of, a lot of white people, racists, were, were mad at the Democrats. So they tried to use coded uh, uh, advertising to attract the racists. And this was called the Southern Strategy. And uh, so Nixon used it, Reagan used it, um, and you can see now in the current election, that, uh, like in the current election, the U.S. is actually uh, targeting Muslims with uh, you know Donald Trump and Ben Carson talking about how Muslims can't run for office, etc. But this is what dog whistle politics is, right? So what we have to do and ask the Canadian society, as a cohesive group, as ask them, is that the kind of society you want to live in? Like you see the picture behind me, right? I would think 
the average Canadian would be appalled that someone would wear such a shirt to a rally. It says, you know, put the white in the put white back in the White House, meaning, you know, Barack Obama's black. Let's put Mitt Romney in the White House. At least he's white. So this this type of dog whistle politics must come to an end. What what you know in, in that in that debate with Harper, what he 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 says dramatically, if you watch the French debate, he says, I will never tell my daughter uh, that she must wear a face covering just because she's a woman. That is dog whistle politics. Who cares what he tells his daughter? Does that affect to, like 30 million Canadians, what he tells his daughter? His, uh, what, he, what, what is she having for breakfast? I don't care. The, the, the point of, of, in politics is, you know, siyasa in Arabic and the in Islamic concept of politics take care of the affairs of people. Not to, not to use dog whistle politics, not to attack groups. We know from Umar bin Khattab, may Allah be pleased with them, he was killed by uh, Mushakil, a Persian. Did, 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 the, did, the, did the Khalifa after him, Uthman, عنه, did he go after Persians? This is ridiculous. And that's the question we must put forth to the Canadian people, is to say, is this the kind of society you really want to live in? And Anas, when he talks about the, the uh, um, uh, like a more, when he gets into the action plan, he'll give you some kind of concrete ideas about this. And really, what are the real issues? And that's what I was getting at when I showed you that uh, the, the kind of leading causes of death. Why aren't they talking about cancer, right? When uh, one of the CBC reporters, she, uh, she got diagnosed with cancer. So because she was a reporter and she had access to the media, she could actually get down to the real issues. And so she had a real uh, you know, interview. She would go interview doctors and they find out. And one of the primary things about cancer is actually prevention. The prevention is through, uh, through uh, like labeling of food. This is one of the big things that uh, th these groups advocate is label the carcinogens in your food. right? So that way the consumers can make more informed choices and avoid those carcinogenic substances. Has any politician brought this up during the election campaign to address those 80,000 people that died? I'm bringing it up, but they're not bringing it up. So shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't politics be about what real issues face Canadians? And that's, again, a question we have to ask the Canadian thing. So the purpose is, is of engagement is to engage on, the, on these kind of concepts, to address that public opinion. What does it mean to be Canadian? Canadians pride themselves on a harmonious society that's not like America. You know, they talk about like when, they, when Americans go to Europe, they put a Canadian flag on the back of their, on their backpack because they don't want to be treated like Americans because people don't like Americans because they're obnoxious, et cetera, et cetera. You see like Trump, right? So, you know, will, will people still put their the Canadian flag on the back if, if, they be, if Canada becomes more like America? Right? So Canadians have to choose what, what, what they want and they'll have to work for it. Right? So, but it's for us to raise that question. The other thing is that we need to explain Islam. Don't defend Islam, but explain it. We shouldn't always be trying to say, like, we're peace-loving, we're not terrorists. Really, we're not going to eat your babies. We're human beings. That should not be our message. Because that means you're giving in to that racism. Because when you accept that, you're giving in to that, to that xenophobia. You're giving in to that Islamophobia, right? Because you're accepting that premise. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa never accepted that premise. He may, always made it about Islam and disbelief. That's what he made the premise. And so the point is, is that what we should be doing is explaining Islam. If people say, why does the woman inherit less than the, than the man? We should explain how the whole Islamic structure works. How in Islam, women have economic rights, whereas in Canada, they don't. It's an obligation for the male members of the family to protect the woman. Tell me what woman wouldn't like that. So, so these, are the way, these are the kind of the ideas how to explain. Like also, you see in my presentation, like when, when people talk about violence, why, like it's again a distraction. We, we showed how cancer is a much bigger issue for Canadians than what they're putting it forth in the media. The, the next E is enable. So enable us to practice our deen. So we need to look and model how Jafar bin Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased them, how he, when he spoke to the Najashi, we must have a similar strategy on protecting our rights here in Canada. And the reason why that example is particularly important is because uh, if he answered, so what happened was if in, in, the, in, the, in the incident was that uh, the Muslims uh, who migrated to Abyssinia initially convinced the Najashi of their case. But Amr bin As, who was uh, in Jahiliya back then, he, uh, he, had, he had an idea of how to get the Najashi to kick out the Muslims, was to tell them, 
that the Muslims consider Isa a slave of Allah, they don't consider him a son of Allah, right? Astaghfirullah. So when Najashi found this out, he assembled the Muslims and the Muslims were like going, oh my God, like if we, the, like sort of the, 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 uh, the uh, motion was that if we tell the truth, we might go back to the torture. If we tell the truth, he might kill us, right? As, uh, as you know, the Christians are very tolerant of other sects, right? One of the things they loved, uh, the, for example, the Greeks loved living under Islamic rule because the Ottomans were more tolerant of them than the other Christians, right? So the Muslims were scared about if we tell them about the truth about Isa al-Islam, we might get kicked out, right? So, but, but uh, Jafar bin Abi Talib, he told the truth about Isa al-Islam, but he also emphasized that how much we loved Isa al-Islam, right? So this is a good example of, 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 that, of that kind of approach, is that we must not compromise Islam in the least just because of fear of torture or humiliation or anything like that, but speak the haq, speak the truth, but then at the same time try to get our rights. The, the, the fifth E uh, is to empower the community. So uh, what, I've, what I've kind of been discussing is sort of like if we get a group together of activists and community leaders to work together, is that we would form the body that would carry out such discussions. However, we must mobilize the Muslim community as a whole to, to do dawah, to connect with the community, to, in, to engage the community, to, tell, to, to open up people's minds uh, about Islam. So let me, let me walk you through a, like sort of a tangible example. When I was, uh, I was, uh, uh, when I was uh, y younger uh, and September 11th happened, I was on a train and uh, the time for uh, Salah came. Uh, I, was, I was going to Montreal, and so I had to pray, right? So uh, you can't miss your salah, right, obviously. And so I prayed. And there was one guy who started freaking out when I started praying, because you know, just, you know, that what, hap what happened most, as you, everyone knows what happened on September 11th. And so this is a French Canadian guy who's, who started like kind of freaking out when I started praying. So I started talking to him after just to calm him down and trying to explain to him that, you know, there's nothing to worry about, etc. Did you know he had no idea we believed in Isa al He had no idea that Muslims believed in Isa al Now, I'm just, I was like, like on that train, I was just, you know, like a regular Muslim, like, you know, but because I engaged him, I was able to show him another, like I was able to like kind of break down that wall that the media puts, that, 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 that wall that Islamophobia thrives off of, where they try to dehumanize us, they see us as something else. Like most people think we're like Sikhs, they don't understand that we come from the, we come from the same sort of, we have the same background, like the prophets and Anbiya and things like that. They have no clue. Like it's, like I was, uh, you know, I was doing dawah to a Christian and it's like, a, what, like uh, he broke off stuff, so I wrote him a letter. And like, when I went through, like, and I showed him all the practices that, that in the Bible, like Isa says, uh, Salam, he does Jude, and these kinds of things. I showed him the connection, right? So we need to have these kind of, these kind of things, especially because it's the evangelicals who support you know, Harper, right? So they know, are they, are they informed about Islam, right? We, it's a mistake to think the evangelicals are a monolith, and none of them are going to listen to us, right? Eventually, Quraysh listened to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Eventually, they supported him. So, what I'm talking about is doing dawah workshops that kind of walk Muslims to this. I'm talking about ongoing support. So, what what it is is that it shouldn't be just like a one-time workshop and then and that's it. So, when because if you're having conversations and someone stumps you with a question like, oh, how do I deal with apostasy? They're they're saying we kill apostates. Like, how do we how do we deal with that? Like, how do you bring the person in? So, you have to have ongoing support. So, just as we promote you know, praying, just as we promote, you know, paying your zakah, the five pillars. We also must promote this dawah. We must have an ongoing support where we support these kind of things. And we get together as, as people, trade stories. Oh, how do you discuss this? Or how do you discuss that issue? Because through that kind of ongoing discussion, we can improve our efforts, right? Because we can learn from each other, right? Just going into the, into the, into the battleground of ideas, as uh, Hayek said. And the other thing is we have to understand the system, right? We have to understand and have a thing. Like to prepare this, uh, this discussion with you, I had to read many kind of uh, books over the years and things like that to understand how actually the system actually works. Uh, one, of the, one of the most important kind of books that I read, especially with this is demonization issue, uh, is, is Manufacturing Consent by Noam Chomsky, which talks about how the media system actually works, how it actually creates a public opinion against 
you know, like in that specific discussion was communism. But you can see those things are being applied to Islam, right? Like one of the things is that uh, there was uh, 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 there was a, uh, a white supremacist group called the White Heritage Front, and. Uh, it was infiltrated by CSIS and just like you saw with the Toronto 18, right, kind of thing, like the CSIS and RCMP, they got infiltrated in that. And this, and this girl wanted to come forth with her story and explain what happened. She was actually a white supremacist at the time. And basically what she came to realize is that they didn't want to conflate terrorism with other than Muslims. And she said that her, herself. Like the reason why Globe and Mail and CBC suddenly backed off her story is because they had to portray Muslims as terrorists, right? And they didn't want to show how it just, it's just another crime just like anything else. It's not specific to a Muslim community, or, right? So just by way of recap, and I'm going to uh, pass this, uh, just have some closing comments and pass it off to Anas. Uh, so we need to engage, engage internally with the community leadership, activists, people who are interested, people who really want to do something of Islamophobia. Uh, we have to make a message for ending dog whistle politics to this kind of coded racism, which is flourishes in America, should, we should ask Canadians, do they want to flourish that in Canada? Uh, we have to explain Islam, don't defend it. We have to, uh, if, uh, you know, we have to enable ourselves to practice the deen in a, in a way that is halal, through the courts, then a halal way. And also empower, empower the community at large to carry on these discussions with society. So Allah knows best, so don't, voting is not gonna help, it's haram, don't do it. Uh, but realize that, voting won't end Islamophobia. As I showed you that picture, you know, just getting rid of Harper is not gonna get rid of that hatred that's been built in the people, right? And it's just gonna be lingering there. Like it's close, like if you look at the polls, it's close, right? It's 39% liberal, 36%. That hatred is just stewing there, right? It's not gonna go away. It's, it's once it's released, it's, it's, it's there. So until, unless we get up and fight it, it's still gonna be there. And we, we can't, it can't be me doing it alone, or, or Bahad doing it alone, or Sheikh Lutfi doing it alone. It can't be any of us just doing it by ourselves. We have to have a, communi a community-based approach to this. And it has to be something that the Muslims unite on, right? Just as uh, the labor united on, it has to be we have to uh, unite on this and, and to fight this. So I'm going to pass it now to Anas, uh, who's going to do a call to action, inshallah.